yeah, so hi everybody. Um, hi again. Uh, my name is Boris, and as um, Bruce already told you all, I work at Wix, and I'm tech lead with one of the uh, groups here. Uh, and uh, today I'd like to talk to you about this, basically. Uh, to those of you writing React, this is probably familiar to you, because usually this is how we address uh, async calls in our React components, right? So uh, we have a regular component, uh, which in one of the lifecycle methods probably makes an async call, uh, which results in um, storing the result of that call uh, in the component state. Uh, we also need to be competent and address uh, possible failure scenarios, like for example, what, what happens if uh, uh, it, ha it takes a while for the data to arrive. Uh, also, we need to take care of different scenarios of failure. So now, like what happens uh, if uh, the call fails for some reason. Um, and my question is, how is this okay? Like, what caused us to uh, to get used to this? And most importantly, like, I think the biggest issue with this is, this is now how we write JavaScript, right? So if you would have done the exact same thing in JavaScript, this is more or less what it would look like. Like, you would have a method, uh, which makes a call, it's, it's, it suspends until the call is resolved, you wrap it with a try-catch, and that's basically it. This is more or less equivalent of uh, the React component we've seen earlier. Um, and this is, I think, where React Query, uh, along uh, with uh, various updates to React, uh, uh, comes in. Um, now, React Query is a library written by a fabulous man uh, named Tano Lenzi, uh, who has a bunch of incredible open source projects. Uh, and this is how he describes the library. It's uh, basically hooks for fetching, caching, updating uh, synchronous data in React. Um, now, this is a mouthful. And uh, we will basically deconstruct and address each and every part of this sentence uh, in my talk. And we will start with the first part which says that React Query is actually a bunch of hooks. And in order to understand uh, the library, we need to first uh, familiarize ourselves with hooks. So um, this is probably a slide you've seen a bunch of times in uh, various talks uh, throughout the years that basically try to summarize what React is, right? Uh, basically, it says that we have a component. The component has props and state, and based of those, on those uh, uh, inputs, it basically produces uh, some sort of UI, right? It can be uh, uh, a DOM, or it can be uh, a native code, like uh, in case of React Native, and so on and so forth. Um, and as you may know, may know, so React has uh, multiple types of those components. Uh, the main ones basically being the class component and a functional component, with the main difference between them being uh, this part, right? Uh, the ability to store state inside a functional component. Uh, and this is what the hooks basically uh, come to address, right? They allow us to have stateful logic inside functional components. Uh, now, if you will go and read, um, React documentation, which is excellent, and I highly recommend you, you do so. Uh, there are over a dozen built-in hooks, uh, but we will familiarize ourselves with just two, the main ones. Uh, so the first one uh, being use state, uh, which basically allows us to store state in a functional component, right? Uh, so we call a built-in use state function, we set a default value, and uh, we receive back the latest state as well as uh, a setter. Uh, the next one being uh, use effect. Basically, use effect allows us to conditionally run side, effect be side effects between the renders uh, of our component. Um, and if we were to rewrite uh, the original component, the class component that we see in the beginning of the talk, this is more or less what it would look like. Um, and I think this is 
pre already a vast improvement over how we used to do things, right? First of all, there is way less code. Uh, and second of all, it is, it is way more concise, right? It's way easier to understand what's going on here, uh, uh, which is awesome. Uh, and as you may have noticed, right, so every, com every hook is just a function, nothing more. Uh, and as every function, we can basically compose functions and create uh, our own hooks, uh, basically by simply creating uh, a function with the prefix use uh, and moving uh, built-in hooks inside of it, right? So here you can see an example of us basically refactoring uh, our uh, previous code and creating a use-proof profile hook. Uh, inside of which you basically encapsulate uh, all the all the calls and uh, managing of errors and so on. Uh, so I think what hooks provide us uh, first of all is this like unified mental model of looking at React. Right. So we no longer have functional components and uh, class components with their life cycle. All we have are just functions. Right. We have components that are functions. We have hooks that are functions and as functions, as all functions inside JavaScript, you can compose them, right? So you can compose hooks with other hooks, you can compose components with hooks, hooks with components, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think one of the main advantages of hooks is actually being overlooked uh, mostly. And and this is this part, right? So if you, you will look at how the, our new hook is uh, consumed, right? You don't see any promises here. You don't see async await. You don't see anything. You, you see uh, a component calling, calling a regular JavaScript function and receiving back the data, despite the fact that inside of it, inside the function, we're actually executing uh, an async call. Uh, and this is, to me, like this realization was mind blowing, right? Because this is a sort of abstraction that we haven't seen before. Uh, not only is that it simplifies things, it's basically, if you think about it, it doesn't even, uh, the component doesn't even know the source of the data it receives. In terms of component, basically, it doesn't care, it doesn't know whether the data comes from a synchronous source, whether it comes from uh, an HTTP call from, web sockets from local storage or whether it's a mocked version of itself from the test. It basically receives a guarantee that it, do, it will not know the source of the data and that it will be called whenever the data is updated. Okay, these are the guarantees that are given to it. Uh, and as revolutionary as it is, there are still several issues uh, that are not solved by hooks and uh, basically uh, remain uh, from the class components, uh, from the class component themselves. And it's the fact that, like, usually we would like to share uh, the, the, the result of the API calls with most of our application. And the problem with state is that the state is still local to the component, right? Uh, and today, usually what we do, we're basically faced with uh, two main options, which is either we reach for React context and share um, share the result of the, basically we lift the API call to the root of our tree, for example, then we share it using uh, the context, uh, or in more complex scenarios, we are forced to reach to a state management library, whether it's uh, Mobex or Redux, wherever it may be. Uh, which complexes things even more because then you basically have this like mixture of uh, what is essentially a server cache with the UI state, and then you need to like map it back and forth when you make uh, when you try to store your data back to the data source, uh, and and so on and so forth. Uh, you also have a hard time like cleaning up uh, the state when the component unmounts and so on. Um, and I think that all of this, this, this complexity is basically caused by the fact that we've been uh, neglecting and neglecting the uh, uh, basically neglecting the, the fact that not all state is basically born equal. 
that the server state and the component state are completely different. They're meant to serve different purposes, right? So a server state, basically I'm talking about the responses coming from your API calls, are nothing more than this cache, your local cache, your local copy of a server state, right? Which, is, which you usually alter or just read from it and then you send it back, right? While the component state is usually meant to deal with different UI concerns, right? Like hiding stuff, toggling stuff, uh, and so on, and like deciding whether something should be rendered or not. Um, the server state uh, is usually global in its nature, right? You usually want to share it with best, part of, best parts of your application, while the component state is usually local to uh, a subtree, right? Or maybe a single node inside your component tree. Uh, and finally, the server uh, state has like various unique uh, concerns, which are basically have nothing to do with uh, with the, the local state, right? You have stuff like caching, like pagination, like synchronization. Uh, I'm not even talking about the fact that it's usually synchronous. Um, and we usually like shoot ourselves in the foot uh, when we basically try to mix them. Right, and this uh, this thought has been brewing inside React community for a while now. You can see uh, can see Dodds uh, with uh, thoughts of uh, of his own about uh, this thing. That basically uh, he he tries to convince us that we need to separate the two. Uh, you can also see examples of that separation inside something like Next.js, where basically they uh, they urge you to separate your uh, your your uh, server your basically your data needs from the state uh, and this is where react query comes in right react query basically uh, adopts this philosophy philosophy and helps us uh, implement it in our code so going back to our original example right this is the uh, brand new hook that we have created uh, and Basically, what happens inside of it are three things, right? We're making, we're making an async call. We're handling uh, the potential uh, uh, failures. And we are also, uh, we're also basically um, storing the result of that call inside uh, our local cache. Now, if we were to uh, refactor this into uh, React Query, this is what it would look like, right? We would use uh, a built-in used query hook. Uh, provided by the library, we would give it some sort of name. We can choose whatever name uh, we want. It can it's basically a string, and then we provide a function which is meant basically to resolve uh, this query, right? And again, this is a regular JavaScript function which returns a promise, um, and the, again, it can be whichever the data source you choose, right? It can be an API call, a local storage call, whatever. Right. Uh, now the return va return values of this uh, of this hook uh, just give us a glimpse into the amount of concerns that are basically being uh, taken care uh, take, taken care by this library. Right. Uh, first of all, as you can see, all of the state all of the query states uh, and stages are basically being managed. Uh, by the library, right? We don't. We no longer need to manage the is is error, is success, or is loading flags. Everything is being managed for us. Uh, we can easily uh, get an access to the error in case it occurs. Uh, we get the amounts of failures. Uh, we get a retry policy and so on and so forth, uh, which is already basically cuts out a lot of boilerplate that we used to implement uh, ourselves. In addition to all of that, uh, it basically it also allows us to uh, easily uh, not just perform queries but also mutations, and we will see example of that uh, later on. Uh, it allows us to very easily uh, implement optimistic updates, uh, which is occasionally great practice uh, in order to improve user experience. Um, now, I don't know if you've ever tried to implement it by yourself, but it's usually a really big headache. And again, this is 
being all of it being handled by this beautiful library. Um, one of the most powerful features is calls the duping, right? So those of you using uh, Apollo uh, or GraphQL um, have been able to use this um, for quite some time. Uh, for those that are more or less lucky, like myself, this is brand new, um, and we will see examples of that as well. Uh, it uh, very easily allows us to implement pagination and infinity scrolls uh, using asynchronous data sources. Um, it allows us to create dependencies between uh, various queries and mutations. Uh, we will see an example of that. Uh, and finally, it gives us a very, very powerful caching mechanism uh, that we can use on the client. So the uh, first example I would like to show you is uh, the query and mutation dependencies. So in this example, we will use a second hook provided to us by the library, is called use mutation, which essentially does just that. It allows us to execute uh, mutations on our server. And in this example, basically, I'm saying, like, what I want to do is I want to make an add to do call. And when it succeeds, I would like to refetch, for example, my to do's list and my reminders list. And as you can see, it is very easy, it is very expressive. Um, the other powerful uh, feature that we have mentioned is uh, caching, right? So let's say we have two components. We have root and we have a child component. And all of them, for some reason, um, require the same data, right? Uh, you can even imagine that the child component is not actually a child, but it's somewhere down. Uh, it's a grand-grandchild of uh, the root component. And usually what would happen is either we would, again, use context or we would uh, use prop drilling or whatever, or whatever technique in order to share um, the data between root and child component for a sole reason that we wouldn't want the child component and root component to fire off the same request, right? And using React Query, we basically no longer have to worry about that because it allows us to cache the request and it allows us to dedupe the request. So for example, if I render a child component and the root component already fired off uh, the request to retrieve our to-do's list, the child component will basically wait for the request uh, fired by its parent to arrive, right? And it will not fire off a, sing a second request, which is already very powerful. Um, but it also, I think, uh, allows, basically uncovers very interesting uh, design patterns when it comes to components. Uh, at my team at Wix, we recalled, for example, some something called, we, we, we've called it some uh, self-contained components, but you can also call them uh, location-independent components. And I'll show you an example. So um, let, let's assume again, we have our example of a parent component and a child component who require exactly the same data, right? And uh, let's say the child component is being conditionally rendered somewhere down the road. Um, Usually what we would do is we would pass in uh, a bunch of props uh, that uh, would basically come from the parent component that already executed several uh, API calls. Again, for the sole reason that we wouldn't want our child call to execute the, 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 the calls once again. Uh, but since, uh, since we basically have no, we no longer have to worry about all of that, our API surface of the child component suddenly becomes very slim because we no longer need to create props uh, dedicated just to receive, basically only to receive uh, the data requirements from the server, right? We can basically very, uh, in a very expressive manner, uh, basically just express inside on it what are the data requirements and the React query basically uh, makes sure to retrieve it in the most efficient fashion possible. Uh, what this allows us to do, and this is the reason we're calling those components uh, uh, self-contained or location-dependent, because the, if you will look at the child component, you can observe that it is no longer dependent on its parent, right? Because 
its, its data requirements are expressed inside of the body of the component. And that means it no longer relies on the parent in order to pass the to-dos list uh, to it, right? So what this allows us to do is basically it allows us to very easily restructure uh, our components tree um, and move them around, right? I can even switch between the two, for example, and, and make my child component a root component and vice versa. Uh, and, it, and the change will be very, very easy and very, very cheap. Uh, a word of caution that uh, we have discovered in my team is that uh, using the cache can be very, very, very addictive uh, and causing various issues. So the biggest one has to do with testing. Uh, at Wix, we are big, big believers in testing and, and in TDD, that's during development. Uh, and what it caused at first is for all, for example, let's say we are uh, testing our root component and then we, for some reason, want to change to test our child component in isolation. This basically uh, causes every single unit test for both root component and the child component to be asynchronous. And uh, for those of you who have ever uh, done code uh, tests for code that, uh, for components that execute an async call, it's a huge, huge headache because then you get into things like uh, waiting for elements and mocking and so on and so forth. Uh, so while React Query is very convenient, uh, we still need to remember that props uh, and context can still be very useful and be very cautious. Um, finally, I would like to talk about uh, suspense. Uh, React suspense, which is basically a new, recently, a relatively new feature introduced in React. So uh, going back to our example, right, uh, after refactoring our class component to functional component and utilizing hook, hooks and utilizing React query, this is more or less what it looks like, right? So we still, we're making our API call inside of the hook. We have React query hand, uh, giving us the data and the flags that uh, signal various stages of uh, the API call. Um, but we still have various concerns that we need uh, to handle ourselves. So for, for example, and I'm talking about like this part uh, mainly, uh, we need to handle missing data, right? So what happens if the data is still being loaded and it takes a while for it to load? We still need to uh, add error handling. Uh, all of it is actually a boilerplate which we copy over and over and over again into various components. Uh, but I think the biggest issue uh, with that approach uh, is the, if this makes the components way more way less reusable. Uh, why? Because let's say I have a parent component that uh, uses our profile page component, and it would like to customize uh, what happens when the when the component is not ready to render. Uh, or, for example, it would like to get notified. Uh, uh, in case there is an internal error inside of our component. Uh, until now, what we would usually do is we start passing various props and use render props in order to pass uh, uh, loaders and pass and create like an on error callback. Um, but, you know, like as we've already mentioned, uh, this is not how we write JavaScript, right? In plain old JavaScript, this is like handling things like that is super easy, right? Again, we're just waiting on our inner function. We wrap it with try catch. We suspend the execution of our of the uh, outer uh, function, and that's it, right? Uh, so what happens in React is that uh, recently this part uh, can now be handled by uh, error boundaries. Uh, inside React. So uh, we no longer need to have all of that boilerplate. We can basically wrap it with an error boundary, uh, which you can either implement yourself or use uh, various libraries, one of them, I think, by uh, can see dots, uh, uh, which you can see in this example. Uh, 
which basically allows your parent to react to the uh, to the errors uh, happening inside of uh, its, its children, inside of its subtree, uh, which is already a vast improvement. Uh, but we still have no solution to this part, right? What happens if my child component takes a while uh, to load? What happens if, for example, it has, uh, I don't know, a lazy component inside of it? What happens if it still awaits for the data to, to, uh, that it requires in order to render to arrive from the server? And this is what suspense uh, comes to solve. Uh, this is a quote from the React documentation, right? So suspense a component lets you wait for any asynchronous work uh, and declaratively specify a loading state while waiting. Um, so again, a mouthful, and I think uh, example would uh, uh, simplify uh, this uh, sentence. So as we already mentioned, suspense is just a component, which is quite similar to error boundary, allows us to uh, wrap uh, the component that ex probably executes some sort of uh, a, a async, that requires some sort of async data uh, in order to get rendered. Uh, and the child components notifies its parents uh, via a magical mechanism that it is still not ready to load for whichever reason, right? It can be, again, because it's, it's waiting for uh, its child component, which is a lazy component, to get loaded, or it's awaiting for some sort of uh, uh, async uh, data source to resolve. And all the while, the parent component can decide what should be rendered while it awaits for its child component to be ready. Um, so basically what, what we see here is that a profile details component tries to render. Uh, it's, it tries reading uh, user details, in our case, uh, a user's profile. It notifies React that it is not; it is still not ready. It is it's missing crucial parts of data in order to get rendered. It notifies the parent, and the parent renders a fallback while it's awaiting. It's what's waiting, right? It can be a loader. It can be whatever you choose. Uh, once the data arrives, the um, React basically resumes the rendering of the child of the subtree wrapped uh, in suspense. Uh, Another example basically uh, we need to is basically shows the fact that suspense is just a React component, nothing more, which means that we can use it as, as much as we like inside our uh, React, uh, inside our component tree, which allows for several very very interesting patterns um, that were not possible beforehand. So let's say a profile timeline. Component suspense because it's it's wait it waits for a timeline uh, data to arrive. So what will happen is that just like try catch, it will uh, fall back to the nearest suspense component, and in our case, basically uh, render a, a loading posts, um, basically render loading posts instead of our component until the data arrives and the profile timeline component is rendered. But what happens if the profile details components actually suspends? And this is where things actually get very interesting uh, because what would happen is that the whole subtree of the utmost suspense component will be uh, uh, suspended. It will basically be removed from uh, the DOM and instead we will see a loading profile component, a, a, loading, a loading profile uh, text, uh, which is very, very interesting. Um, the problem with all of that is that, uh, as you can remember, right, we need to somehow notify React that our component is not ready to render. And this is where things get hard because implementing this notification part currently is very, very hard. Uh, you see an asterisk here because um, React team is working on something that should simplify it uh, vastly. But currently, it's, it's, it needs to be handwritten, and it's quite non-trivial. You basically need to throw a promise-like object instead of an error. Uh, long story short, it's a really, really big headache. Uh, luckily for us, uh, React query 
does support suspense uh, out of the box. You can just need to enable it uh, via a very simple configuration, uh, which is uh, great. Now, we've adopted uh, React Query uh, uh, at Wix, um, and we've never looked back uh, because I think it has been very transformative to our experience and now and mostly and most importantly our mindset as uh, as developers because now all of a sudden uh, because you have things like suspense uh, which can be very easily utilized using react query uh, it basically promotes you to think of resilience right so you all of a sudden are forced to think like what happens if if my call fails right what happens for example if it takes a while right so maybe i can uh, place the data request uh like move it lower in my component tree and spend just a part of it instead of basically suspending the whole uh, component tree and improve my user experience it also again using uh, arrow boundary allows us to very easily implement fallbacks in case of various failures um, uh, but I think most importantly is that it at Wix it basically should allow like it 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 made the the resilience and uh, and, and resilience and uh, and performance an integral part of the product design and the architecture design because now developers actually are like they they prompt the product managers and the UX. Uh, uh, and, and user experience people to basically define uh, at the very beginning uh, what happens when uh, what happens if uh, this component does not load. Maybe, we, for example, we can disable part of the functionality of of our page while still giving providing value to our uh, customers. Um, and like step by step, it actually like it, it actually became like a part like it it, it changed the thought process uh, of both the designers and the product managers. So uh, let's summarize. Um, hooks are a, a paradigm shift. Um, I think most people, once they get introduced uh, to hooks at first, uh, their first thought is that, well, oh, well, well, this is just an alternative API to what we used to have. Uh, but I think, uh, like, it is while while it is true. I think it has so it allows so many amazing patterns, uh, and uh, and it's it's it basically provides a very interesting uh, changes to our mental model uh, that can be easily overlooked. And I think uh, we should all really look into them. Um, React Query uh, basically utilizes the, the, those patterns that I've mentioned that hooks allow us in order to simplify. Uh, the code that anything that has to do with uh, um, fetching the synchronous data or mutating it. Uh, it promotes the separation uh, between uh, the server state and the UI state while addressing all the concerns, all the unique concerns that uh, actually uh, server cache actually has. Um, I think it also promotes uh, this uh, a pattern of collocating uh, data requirements with the components themselves, right? So instead of making the API call somewhere uh, uh, in the parent and then uh, you know providing via props or any other mechanism to our children, we can now very expressively collocate um, uh, the data requirements in the component, right? And also basically slim down the API surface uh, of those components. Um, and finally, uh, combined with suspense and error boundaries, uh, I think overall it just causes us to write a way better code, right? Both in terms of resiliency and in terms of uh, and in terms of performance, which basically provides uh, a better user experience for uh, our users. Um, that's it. Thank you all. Um, had a lot of fun.